you'll hear a tour guide talking to a group of visitors about Bestley Castle. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Welcome to Besley Castle. It's nice to see so many of you here today. Before we go in, I'd like to tell you some information about the castle, the things to see and do, and the facilities available to you in the grounds. We'll do our best to make this a truly memorable visit. Now, the castle grounds are quite big, and we don't want you to get lost so I'm going to give you an idea of the layout. At the moment, we are at the entrance, and immediately to our left is the tourist information office. Go here if you need any questions answered. They'll be happy to help. And of course, behind the tourist office is the car park where the coach dropped you off, and it'll also pick you up from the same spot at 5 p.m. today. In front of us are the water gardens, if you stroll through, you get to the North Bridge, which is the entrance to Besley Castle. Take your time and enjoy looking around the castle. There's a lot of history steeped in those walls. As you leave the castle via the South Bridge, you'll be greeted with the sight of roaming deer. During the day, there will be scheduled feeding opportunities where visitors can get involved. However, we do request that you do not feed the deer outside these times. To the right of the deer park is the Castle Museum, and behind that is our award-winning restaurant. It's a relatively new addition to the castle grounds, but is fast gaining a reputation for its food. Alternatively, you can choose to dine in the picnic area on the other side of the deer park. It's perfect for the family as it's next to the kids' play area and homemade ice cream hut. We hope that on your way out, you pop into the gift shop by the exit for something to remember us by. You now have some time to look at questions 16 to 20 on page 41. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Right, well, here we are, standing at the meeting point on the lower ground floor, just to the right of the main entrance. I've given you all a plan of the building so that we can orientate ourselves and get an idea of where we'll be going. Now, Outside the main entrance, you'll see the wide piazza with the stunning sculpture of Newton. The sculptor was Paolozzi, but it's based on the famous image by William Blake, and it's definitely worth a closer look. On the other side of the piazza from the statue is the conference centre, which is used for all kinds of international conventions. We'll take a quick look inside at the end of our tour. Looking ahead of us now, you'll see that we're standing opposite the staircase down to the basement where you'll find the cloakroom, and to the left of that we have the information desk where you can find out about any current exhibitions, uh, the times of the tours and anything you need to know if you don't have a tour guide. As you can see, on this lower ground floor we also have a bookshop. That's the area over to the left of the main entrance. You'll be free to browse there when we get back to the ground floor. Now, opposite the main entrance on this floor, we have the open stairs leading up to the upper ground floor. And at the top of them, in the middle of the upper ground floor, you can see a kind of glass-sided tower that rises all the way up through the ceiling 
and up to the first floor. This is called the King's Library. It's really the heart of the building. It was built to house the collection that was presented to the nation in 1823 by the King. You can see it from every floor above ground. When we go up there, you'll find the library's treasures gallery on the left. Uh, can you find it on your plan? That's the exciting one. <laughs> so we'll be visiting that first, but we'll also take a look at the stamp display situated behind it on the way to the cafe. Uh, a lot of people miss that. The cafeteria runs along the back of the floor and in the right-hand corner you'll find the lifts and toilets. <laughs> Always good to locate them. The other main area on that floor is the public access catalogue section and I'll show you how that operates when we get up there. Now you have some time to look at questions 36 to 40. Now listen to the rest of the talk and answer questions 36 to 40. So, how is that great wheel held up? How did it get there? The starting point was, of course, the ground. And while parts of the wheel itself were still being constructed in various countries, tension piles were being driven into the ground beside the River Thames. This was the first step, and once these were securely in place, a base cap was installed over them as a kind of lock, with two giant plinths pointing up onto which an A-frame was attached, like a giant letter. All this took many months and incredible effort, but meant that the spindle could be installed around which the great wheel would turn. Now the project really was in business, and the vast rim, with spokes like an outsized bicycle wheel, could be brought in. The passenger capsules were assembled and hung onto the rim, each one linked by mounting rings that would support eager viewers as they rose above London. And the last thing to be built is the first thing the visitor encounters, the boarding platform laid down underneath. The whole process employed thousands of people in total and was avidly watched by millions. How long the eye will stay is uncertain, but any talk of dismantling it always meets with immediate protest. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Welcome everyone to the Brandon Complex, the geographical and, we could say, spiritual heart of this university. This is basically where everyone eats too, as you can see by looking around. There are many different cuisines here, Chinese, Indian and Middle Eastern, plus the usual fare of a local type, all in that corner over there. We have many shops here too, but the biggest is Wilson's, right there, providing clothing and hardware. That's next to all the restaurants. Now, on the opposite side of Wilson's we have three shops. The one in the corner there, closest to the restaurants, is for DVDs. Yes, the DVDs are cheap and affordable, and you can also rent DVD players as well. Moving on. In the corner directly opposite Wilson's is the Student Union office. Incidentally, you are all encouraged to join the Student Union. 
as a student union card gives you many benefits, including discounts on basically everything you can buy here at the Brandon complex. Outside this complex, on the other side of the road, you can just see it from here in fact, is a building that we call by the rather unusual name, the H building. Next to this, on the other side of some trees along the main road, is the Engineering Institute, but that doesn't have anything to do with the Brandon complex. One last thing is that just outside this door, near us here, you can see a grassy oval patch. Well, that's the playing field for what we simply call the fitness room, which is alongside. So you can put on some calories here at the restaurants and then burn them off at the fitness room afterwards. Oh, I forgot to mention this shop right here, in the middle, beside the student union. It's the bookshop. And, as you can see, it's always busy, always popular. You can buy newspapers, magazines and stationery there, plus a few clothing items as well, just as you can at Wilson's. Why don't you go and take a look right now? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Section 4. You will hear a lecturer discussing the possibility of creating nuclear fusion. First you have some time to look at questions 31 to 35. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 35. We look at the sun, a huge ball streaming out essentially limitless energy into space, and we think about how we need that energy here on Earth. Our oil reserves are running out, coal burning causes much pollution, and nuclear energy has many dangers. But where does the sun itself get its energy? The answer is that the sun makes it using fusion, or, more specifically, in a hydrogen fusion process. There is no pollution, no radioactivity, no waste products, and we have plenty of hydrogen. So, hydrogen fusion seems the perfect answer to our energy needs, and scientists have long attempted to achieve it here on Earth. So what happens during this process? The first step, is to make two light atomic particles approach. In the case of our Sun, these are hydrogen particles, the lightest and also the easiest to deal with. However, the problem is that the nuclei of atoms have electric fields and fusion between these particles is opposed by their similar electric charge. They most naturally repel each other and the nuclei of all elements are exactly the same in this respect. Thus, in order to overcome this repulsion and force them together, in the second step, the particles are heated. The trouble is, you need a lot of heat, incredible temperatures of the sort only seen on the surface of the sun. This is many millions of degrees, far higher than the melting point of any known material. Still, the concept is simple. The hot, wildly moving particles, which are now called plasma, will crash into each other, resulting in the third step, the fusion into helium, which releases energy and begins a self-sustained process. Before you hear the rest of the lecture, you have some time to look at questions 36 to 40.
Now listen and answer questions 36 to 40. So, we know how fusion works. Thus, the big question is, can we create it here on Earth? We actually have the technology to superheat hydrogen into plasma, but no container on Earth can deal with those temperatures. Thus, we need to confine this superheated material so that it doesn't touch anything. For that, we need a special reactor, and most research has focused on an apparatus known as a tokamak system. That's T-O-K-A-M-A-K, -A -A an acronym from some Russian words meaning toroidal chamber with magnetic field. It's an apt name, since a very powerful magnetic field is used to confine and suspend the super hot plasma in the air so that it doesn't touch anything. This is possible only because this plasma has an electric charge which interacts with the magnetic field. Of course, the walls of the fusion vessel will still get hot, very hot, and to avoid being melted they must be cooled with a cryogenic system to intensely low temperatures. But now we are faced with the second problem. If we are to draw power from this system, the reaction must be continuous and controllable. However, when fusion begins, the plasma becomes unstable, and at these temperatures, that is a very serious situation. If we lose control, a disaster could result. Despite the obstacles, in 2010, a European device managed some success, but needed far more power to generate the fusion reaction than that produced from the fusion itself. Obviously, then, it was not useful as a power source. More to the point, this system could only sustain a fusion reaction for a fraction of a second, yet to self-sustain, the fusion needs to run for at least 10 seconds. And the future looks bleak. Unfortunately, most scientists predict that many decades will have to pass before fusion power can become a practical reality. First, you have time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Hello everyone. I'm Doreen, the receptionist at the Daisy Child Care Centre. Thank you all for coming to our open evening. I'll just show you round and tell you a bit about the place. First of all, I will have to ask you to leave your sneakers and sandals etc. here on the shoe rack, just inside the main door. You know how the young ones love crawling around the floor, so our policy is no street footwear inside. As you can see, our facility is very open plan. There are lots of different activity areas, and we like to have pretty good visibility throughout the centre. This central area to the left is where we all gather for stories, songs and some games. That's why the big circular carpet is there. Everyone comes to sit there two or three times a day. I can see some of you looking at our TV. Some parents worry that we might just dump the kids there to watch rubbish all day. But of course that's not the case. In fact, we only use it occasionally. For example, we use it if we have a story on a DVD. And then we get the kids to do a bit of acting based on that. That bookcase there beside the TV gets a lot of use, though. Some of the older kids choose to sit and read or look at picture books in their free time, but we never allow them unsupervised TV. If you look along the wall on the far side of the little gate leading into the main room, you can see our kitchen play area. It has lots of utensils, pots and pans. And that cupboard closer to the corner is the dress-up cupboard. That's a very popular area, 
with the boys as well as the girls. You'd be surprised how much the boys get into acting and make-believe. Now over here, opposite the gate and behind the big lunch table, are the sinks and the painting area, and then the doors to the outside. To the right of those outside doors, you can see hooks and little cubby holes on the wall for coats, bags and outdoor shoes. The children can keep slippers in there, but most of them run around indoors in their socks or bare feet. If you can bear it, I think we should pop out into the cold for a moment to have a look round outdoors. We'll just stay under the veranda. The sand pit is over there at the far left of the outside area, and that box next to it is storage space for buckets and spades, and lots of trucks and diggers to push around or even ride on. The slide beside that is popular, and so are the three climbing walls over by the fence. Some parents think that's a bit adventurous for preschoolers, but the older ones love them. The ground is covered with bark, so it's not a harsh surface when they do fall. The ordinary swings and a tire swing are here in front, where we can keep an eye on everyone, and then the chickens are way over on the far right, so they can have a bit of peace and quiet occasionally. OK, so let's go back inside and I can talk about our rules and policies. You have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now I'm going to give you a plan of the site and I'd just like to point out where everything is so that you can explore everything for yourself. We're currently standing at the entrance which is marked with the arrow on the map. If you follow the trail up to our left you will find the information centre. There's a great photo booth there where you can have your photograph taken with Mount Rushmore in the background for a fee of only $10. What a great souvenir. In front of us is the refreshment centre, where you can help yourselves to coffee, locally grown tea, and a delicious selection of cold drinks and biscuits. Be sure to stay hydrated, as it can get really hot up here. To our right, not far up the trail, is the gift shop. Here we sell copies of the guidebook, and it's also the perfect place to pick up some small souvenirs for yourself your family and friends. Now, further up the trail, behind the gift shop, is a big stone building with a workshop. This is where all of our souvenirs are made by hand, which you can purchase in the gift shop, like I said before. Some are even carved from pieces of rock taken from Mount Rushmore itself. If you carry on walking up the trail past the workshop, you'll find our state-of-the-art visitor centre where you can find maps of the walking trails here at Mount Rushmore. Now for the real treat. After you have walked past the visitor centre, you can follow the trail up to the left, which will take you to our wooden shelter. From here, you will have the best view of Mount Rushmore that there is, an experience not be forgotten. Right, if anyone wants a guided tour, then I'm starting at the information centre. If you'd like to follow me, this way please. First you will have time to look at questions 11 to 15.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Well, we certainly have a busy day ahead of us, so let's get started, shall we? You'll find a map of the museum with the itinerary I've just handed out. The museum's our first port of call, so uh, let's have a look at the map now. The door on the right of the entrance hall leads into the gift shop and ticket centre. Once we pick up our entrance tickets, I'd ask everyone to deposit their bags and coats in the cloakroom, which is located towards the back of the gift shop and ticket centre. If you want to pick up an information leaflet, you can approach the information desk situated along the right-hand side. Now, once you come back into the entrance hall, the door on the opposite side to the gift shop leads into the art gallery. There is a special exhibition on there at the moment which is not to be missed. If you continue on up the entrance hallway, that leads into the main exhibition centre. At the back left-hand side, there are some toilets. Beside the toilets, you'll find the 3D theatre. I strongly recommend that you make time for the 30-minute presentation in the theatre. It is well worth a viewing. Running along the right-hand side of the main exhibition centre is the Modern Art Studio. Here, not only can you view some of the most famous works of the 20th century, but you can also sit in on a workshop run by a local artist. So, that's the Art Museum. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. All right, you know about the history of Arthur Island and the details of our tour there, so let me now tell you a bit about the specific sites and attractions on the island itself. It's a small place, but there's a lot packed in there. If you want to cuddle a koala, the wildlife park is the first place to go. That's on the most easterly point, a small promontory sticking out into Bass Strait. But be careful, the wind can be very strong. Hold on to your hats, literally. By that time, you'll probably be ready to eat, and you could choose between Reggie's Restaurant or eating at the Nature Reserve, or at some of the restaurants right in the middle of the island. If it's Reggie's you want, take the complimentary bus down to the southern tip. Reggie's is right on the port, taking its famous seafood directly from the boats. How fresh is that? But to save time, you could go northwards to the very opposite point of the island and eat at the restaurant in the nature reserve, then go and see the beautiful coastal scenery there. And what better way to do this than cycling? There are many trails, and Anderson's Beach also offers some beautiful opportunities for cyclists. As well as for swimming and surfing, of course. Get the bicycles, however, on the opposite side of the island, in the main township. Finally, you might want a reminder or souvenir of your trip. Obviously, there are souvenir shops all over the island, with many at Anderson's Beach. But the main spread of tourist shops is centrally located and right on the main road so that they are accessible to everyone, no matter where you are. Yes, at Arthur Island, you'll find everything you want to do and more. Now, do you have any questions? That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. As we discussed, Liz, my first task on this project is to get data using interviews, over 100 of them. To do that, I'll need to put a flyer on the university notice board to get volunteers. OK, just do that and we can start immediately. But I tried this last year and almost no one replied. The whole project was a failure as a result. You just need to ensure that the flyer is designed well. I did a course in design, so I can help you. I'm all ears. Well, one of the first rules, since the notice board will be full of papers, is to make sure your flyer stands out. Thus, don't use white paper. Use coloured paper. You mean like yellow paper? Yellow, red, orange, it doesn't matter, as long as it's coloured and thus more obvious. Similarly, make the heading attract people, and money does this, right? Well, sure. Everyone wants money. So don't say something boring such as, help needed, but something such as, easy money. That will immediately attract people's interest, and also ensure they know that it won't take much time. These interviews are about half an hour, so tell them that right under the heading. Sounds good. Keep going. Well, by the same token, people don't have the time to read. They don't want to struggle through a large number of words. Thus, limit them. That will make the fly easily and quickly read. Finally, there's a lot of false advertising and tricky people out there, so the readers might get suspicious, particularly when you're offering significant money for little work. You need to thus assure them that this is legitimate. So, at the very top of the page, make sure you indicate that the scheme has been approved by the course convener. Just some writing saying this. But you should also add a signature. It doesn't matter who signs it. People don't read it anyway. In fact, you could even sign it yourself. Don't worry. I can get a legitimate signature. But you should definitely include a stamp, which is more reassuring to the readers. What sort of stamp? The department stamp. Some people put the university stamp, but to be honest, anyone can acquire that from the student union. A stamp from your department shows much more authenticity, and that way everyone will feel that the scheme is legitimate and hopefully be willing to give you a ring. So that's it? It's all finished? That's it, apart from the contact details at the bottom of the page, of course. Of course. Hey, that was some useful advice. I think a flyer like that will really draw them in. Thanks for that. No problem. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Welcome to the library, or the ILC, which means Independent Learning Centre, and let me explain about some of its facilities. We're standing here at the entry gates, next to the borrowing desk. That's where you check out any books, but you are also advised to study in the library here, since most of our material cannot be borrowed. Thus, we have seating along the middle of the library, and in that far corner in front of us, on the left, we have the quiet reading section for some serious reading activity. We used to have the computers there, but then realised that that corner was very quiet, and thus better suited for the purpose it now has. The computers were instead shifted to a more central location, right beside us here on the left. Again, somewhat confusingly, this area once housed the newspaper and magazine section, but the people in the quiet reading area had to walk too far to collect this literature, so it was moved to right beside them in the adjacent corner. So, feel free to read the newspapers there, but the reference books, those huge weighty dictionaries, atlases and encyclopedias, we're all situated at the opposite end of the building, against the wall. This was because they weren't generally that popular, and we wanted more space for the magazine racks, always a favourite with readers. OK, as well as reading, you need to work on your listening skills, and for that you need the audio section. Again, such an activity needs a quiet area, so we put this in the last remaining corner, up there on your right. As you can see, there are CD players and headphones, so just borrow the listening packs, sit down there and listen away. 
Right, that just leaves the main library. In other libraries, that's often right beside the newspaper and magazine section, allowing freedom to choose from all genres of literature. But here, we've got them further apart. For the main library, just follow your nose past the central seating there, and it's there among all that shelving, upon which you'll find an abundance of interesting books and listening packs to use. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. You have some time to look at questions 36 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 36 to 40. So I've told you about the difficulty in detecting neutrinos. They are tiny, virtually weightless, have no electric charge and hardly interact with anything at all. Yet we can detect them and to see how let's consider the Sudbury installation once again. The detector there consists of a spherical container filled with heavy water. This rests inside another vessel filled with normal water, which helps support the weight of the inner sphere, as well as providing further shielding from any stray radiation. At the edge of this inner sphere are about 10,000 electronic detectors. These are extremely sensitive, able to multiply a hundred million times any electric current which occurs. So, as the neutrinos pass through this sphere of water, there is a very, very, very small chance that one of them may hit a water molecule. To increase the likelihood of this, two strategies are used. One, the larger the sphere of water, the better, and the Sudbury tank holds not 10 tonnes, not 100 tonnes, but 1,000 tonnes. Two, the water is special, consisting as it does of heavier molecules. So what happens is this. If the neutrino hits the water molecule, the neutrino is absorbed, but the molecule itself splits apart, producing a tiny electric current. It is this which is detected and analysed, giving key information about the neutrino. The final question is why do we care about these elusive particles? Well, just think. They can pass right through the core of our sun at the speed of light without being affected or losing strength. No other form of radiation can do that, meaning that the knowledge we get about neutrinos can help us to control them. With this ability, we can probe the centre of our Earth, the inner layers of our sun, and the outer limits of our solar system. And that makes it all worth the effort. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now we're currently standing at the gate, which is marked with the arrow on the map. Now if any of you need to visit the toilets before we get started, they're right here to our left. Out to the east, just across the grass, there is the bird hide, where we have over 100 species of birds for you to watch. We even have an interactive zone where you can feed them with seed and take photographs with our parrots. What a great souvenir to remember your trip! And up the path to the north, if you look in front of you now, there is the pie dog zone. Although it is closed, 
If any of the dogs are playing outside, you will be able to see them through the fence. And then let's pass by the refuge. This area is a sheltered part for Brolga watchers, who can use it to spy through binoculars. And after that, I suggest that you all visit the rest area for some cold drinks and snacks, as it is very hot outside. It is just at the northwest corner of the zoo. After that, you could cut across the path to the large rectangular hut, where you will be able to see our new edition of fierce lions. The mother has just had cubs, so it is really quite a rare thing to see. And around to the west, for those of you who want to visit Frisbee, our native kangaroo, he is in the circular-shaped hut just up the path to the left. Don't forget to have your photo taken with him. Now, as I mentioned before, you can purchase your discounted tickets at the photo shop, and this is also where you will come to collect any photos you have had taken at the zoo during your visit. The photo shop is located at the southwest corner of the zoo. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, enjoy your visit.